Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and welcome to my sixth Voxel Game Engine devlog. In this video, I'm looking forward to jumping into the details and sharing how the Rust programming language has transformed my Voxel project. I'll be discussing the new design patterns that I devised in order to structure my project in Rust, how the engine's API will look moving forward, and some new features, like threading in a web browser, that I've achieved with the language. Before we begin, a brief bit of background. I'm designing what will become a massive voxel platform, a scalable game architecture where users can create, destroy, collaborate, and extend their experiences with mods or plugins. The objective is to have a single game client, which can be downloaded or used in a web browser to play mini games, explore Minecraft-like sandbox worlds, and more. This video is meant to act as a follow-up to episode 5, where I discuss the networking capabilities of my platform. I hope to cover here many of the engineering details elided from the last video. So buckle in folks, today things are going to get technical. Let's dive into how Rust influenced my project's design. I began the project with an object-oriented mentality. I intended to somewhat duplicate the system that the Unity engine uses, where game objects are made up of one or more component classes, which inherit from a common base type. Then, the engine maintains a list of all loaded objects and invokes the relevant update methods on each. One customizes the behavior of objects by overloading these update methods. In the update methods, you do things like query other objects, send network requests, get the FPS count to perform time-sensitive animations, and more. In my earliest days of writing Rust, I began trying to set up this sort of system, and quickly hit a wall. You see, the code design, which I had in mind, is almost impossible, or, at least, very cumbersome to accomplish in Rust. You can sort of visualize standard object-oriented code as a big interdependent graph with different objects that rely on one another. To provide its memory and thread safety guarantees, Rust explicitly forbids this type of code. In Rust, the object graph must form a tree. Each object can have only one parent that can access it. Access can be transferred, or objects can be referenced, but these sorts of operations are constrained by the compiler's borrow checker feature. As such, writing idiomatic Rust requires a very different approach to the system of interdependent models which I had in mind. These language features can be both a curse and a blessing. As a newcomer to the language, the borrow checker felt overbearing, and it was frustrating to be unable to hash out a quick solution to problems. But this restriction has its merits, because it encourages you to write code in line with Rust's functional programming paradigm. By forcing you to decouple state, Rust allows you to write modular, data-oriented code that scales better and is less error-prone. Certain algorithms such as the voxel octree generation and rendering code, felt especially natural to implement. But the problem of writing a game engine, with many interrelated features, was more difficult. The networking system would need to send updates to the rendering and physics systems, the rendering and animation systems would need to access the timing system, and all code would need to reference the state of voxel objects. After much thought, and three different iterations, though, I believe that I have devised a system off of which I can scale my game. In order to understand my solution, it's important to take a functional programming perspective. Games designed in a functional language can often be thought of as a sort of pipeline. They take the current game state as input, apply some transformations to it, and then output the next state. This is ideal because it requires no references, just raw data. 
Such philosophy leads naturally to a common design pattern in game development. Entity Component Systems In an entity component system, one specifies world data as a set of entities. An entity is a list of components which specify its attributes. For example, a player entity might have a position component and a velocity component. Finally, the world is updated by systems which apply changes to all entities that share certain components. For example, going back to the player for a moment, the physics system might look at the velocity component and change the position based upon the player's current velocity. This system works well because it decouples state. Each component and system is separate, but was too simplistic for my taste. I needed systems to be able to store data specific to themselves. For example, the graphic system would need to store handles to GPU objects and react to events raised by other systems. This led me to the current engine design around which I am building my game. I have a hybrid event system and entity component system, which allows for decoupled state and reactive code. Here's roughly how it works. I have a world state, which contains entities and components. The world state also has some shared resources, like the system time, that all code can use. The world is acted upon by systems which can maintain their own internal state for storing things like GPU handles. In turn, each system is a collection of event handlers, which respond to certain events, like the beginning of a frame, and can issue others. This allows the input subsystem to broadcast an event when, say, the player clicks a button, and then have the network system respond to that by sending a message to a server. The event system was implemented using Rust generics, so all I need to do when defining new events is create a function and register it as an event handler. The system works very well and makes it very easy to prototype new concepts. Most importantly, the event system is open source and available to view on my GitHub. See the description for more information. In addition, I solved a number of other interesting Rust problems in order to achieve full voxel multiplayer. One thing I had to do was port my c -sharp code for sparse voxel octree modification to Rust. An explanation for the algorithm can be found in episode 3, but in short, it starts by checking whether large chunks of voxels are of the same material. If so, it writes the block into the data structure, otherwise, it starts considering smaller chunks of voxels. This algorithm for octree generation is actually a very similar procedure, no matter the type of generation involved. Converting an array to an octree, merging two octrees together, or doing world generation. As such, I sought to abstract as much of the logic as I could by writing a set of functions common to all octree generators. I eventually defined an octree builder trait that describes an operation to create a voxel octree, like merging two other octrees together, which can easily be extended to create new algorithms, like terrain generation. All that's needed is a way to specify which regions of voxels all share the same material. This is a wonderful example of Rust's zero-cost abstractions. The octree builder trait hooks into the common octree generation code by a means of a generic type, something that the Rust compiler rewrites at compile time. This means that my octree builders are as fast as if I performed no abstraction at all and wrote each special function from scratch. This is in contrast to object-oriented languages. If octree builder were an inherited type, then the calls to the octree builder methods would be virtual, requiring extra steps at runtime to invoke a very performance-critical section of code.
Thanks, Russ. Last, but not least, I want to address an interesting point about multi-threading on the web. For my project, being able to run code in parallel is a must. At the very least, I need both a client thread for performing graphics tasks and a server thread for performing game logic. To accomplish this natively was simple. I just spawn an OS thread for both server and client. In the case of the web, though, I was required to utilize a feature called Web Workers for the same functionality, since browsers won't allow you to spawn native threads. Web Workers are typically isolated from the rest of one's code, only able to send simple messages back and forth. However, it's actually possible to share WASM modules, that is WebAssembly modules, between threads using something called a shared array buffer. With the help of shared array buffer and a Rust crate called WASM thread, I was able to get fully functioning threads working on the web. Thank you very much for watching my Voxel Engine devlog. I hope that this video provides some additional insight into the Voxel Engine design. In the next episode, I intend to implement a large-scale voxel world and an optimized voxel rendering pipeline. The video should be a return to more high-level development content. If you want to see that video, then please do leave a like and subscribe. Additionally, if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comment section below. With that, and until next time, have a lovely day.